Discoveries in technology, medicine and nutrition are emerging with accelerating speed and improving our health and quality of life. Join us in a series of conversations about exploring the new pharma and biotechnology trends. This is a view on parenteral administration of drug products brought to you by Lonza. Today, it's a special episode because for the first time, we are speaking with an internal Lonza expert. Hans Christian Mahler, the head of Lonza's Drug Product Services, or short for DPS, along with Ahmed Bashir, head of the formulation development within DPS. To complement its well-established services in the drug substance field, Lonza established the Drug Product Services to serve its customers and their patients who need an end-to-end service from gene to vial. The highly experienced team provides practical and scientific solutions to complex problems while keeping the focus on safety, reduced complexity and regulatory compliance. When it comes to developing products for intravenous, subcutaneous or intraocular administration, one has to keep in mind that handling materials which are present in IV bags Filters and syringes can also influence the quality and stability of the final product. Hi Hans Christian, hi Ahmed, welcome to the podcast. Let me start by asking you Hans Christian, what is the story of drug product services? Lonza Drug Product Services really started in an entrepreneurial setup by end 2016 with a group of 25 experts. Uh, we meanwhile grew to around 250 colleagues and enjoy a diverse team with around 30 nationalities um, on, on our team. Right now we are expanding also into an additional building with Building G here on uh, the Stücke campus in Basel. Our focus is really to deliver safe, high quality and efficacious and easy to administer products for our customers' patients. So in general, how are drugs administered to the patient? Is there anything that can go wrong during this process? Biotech products need to be injected uh, or infused. So this could be by injection or infusion into arteries, veins, into the subcutaneous tissue, into the vitreous humor of the eye, into the cranium, uh, etc. So there's many routes of injection uh, administrations. And many things can go wrong. It's from dose preparation up to administration, which could end up in the wrong dose being administered and product contamination or mix-up and producing, hence, a potential impact on the safety or efficacy of a product. I guess that this is the reason why administration sets and medical devices are really important. So a question to you, Ahmed. How do these sets and devices actually work? These are really needed to administer the correct dose with the right properties to the patient. Many drug products require certain handling procedure and administration devices to administer this correct dose to the patient. This is even more important for phase one studies where there is a dose escalation and the usually start at a very low dose. So when you take the administration set, do you test the entire set together or each material individually? It is tested together, so we simulate the whole administration process, um, including a time, exposure to light, different temperatures, potential um, shaking, uh, and so on. So the whole process is actually simulated exactly as it is done in the clinic to make sure that the right dose with the right quality attributes is administered to the patient. Are there any challenges and limitations of using these sets or devices? Yeah, in principle, there are many challenges that can be encountered. Um, For example, as mentioned, at very low doses for the uh, phase one clinical studies, there can be a challenge of absorption that the dose that is administered is not really the right dose. There is also the challenge of compatibility. The different sets and the different uh, medical devices, they are made of different materials. And we have to ensure that there is no incompatibility due to contact with those materials. And if I may ask, what do you exactly mean by incompatibility? So incompatibility, I can give you an example. For um, Many of the proteins have a tendency for aggregation, and um, this aggregation can manifest itself as either um, subvisible particles or visible particles. And we evaluate whether the 
compatibility or the interaction with the material can lead to formation of such particles. Another thing is change in the chemical properties of the molecule, so formation of different charge variants, for example. So this can certainly lead to either degree of efficacy or, for example, sometimes immunogenicity. Um, so that's what we uh, would like to make sure that there are no uh, negative impacts on the patient. So why do we need simulated in-use stability and compatibility testing? I do think we need simulated in-use stability compatibility testing really to be able to help our colleagues in clinical practice and trying to give guidance on how they best prepare and administer the drug in order to make sure that the products that they are giving to the patients remain of adequate quality and that the safety and efficacy will remain. All these clinical pharmacies around the world have different procedures. They may have preferences for different infusion bags. They may have preferences for different infusion lines and, and for filters. And it's really our task to support our customers in designing an adequate administration protocol and perform adequate simulated testing in a laboratory setting that all the different ways of how the drugs can be administered, let's say in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, in the Netherlands, in China, in Japan, in the US, that all these different clinical centers receive a level of guidance on how the drug should be administered to ensure that all the patients will be adequately receiving a benefit from the drug and not be adversely impacted. And do you write these procedures and recommendations and then ship them together? with the administration set and the drug to the clinic? Yes, we do write the pharmacy manual. So um, we provide the exact procedure that is required uh, to be performed in the pharmacy, in the, in the clinic. Um, we provide this to our customers so that uh, they really follow this procedure. How exactly do you define an administration set? Is a syringe already an administration set? Yes, it is. So everything that is used for administration in the clinic is an administration set. And, and this is uh, quite interestingly an evolving field. So there are many things that are now um, coming as new devices. And we recently published on this topic as well. I think it's also an evolving field in the sense mm -hmm. that there's not a lot of detailed regulatory guidance on how actually to perform mm -hmm. such tests. Mm -hmm. The compatibility with administration material must be ensured, but it's often subject to the individual pharmaceutical company to really think about which devices this relates to. As to your question, is a syringe a device? It certainly is. So if you have a product in a vial, you withdraw the solution and then the solution maybe gets stored for eight hours in that syringe before it's administered into the eye of a patient, for example. Mm -hmm. It certainly has a significant potential of, of interacting with the surface or, the, or this medical device and lead to some potential safety implications, etc. So uh, this is where I think um, the, the regulatory field and the requirements are evolving. However, they're not very precise. So this is, I think, uh, another challenge that is just put on top of it. Are you also performing basic research in DPS? Yes, we do perform basic research. We also have masters, PhD students and postdoc um, working in different topics related to drug product development and manufacturing. And could these results help to guide the regulatory landscape and maybe to help to co-create the rules for the future? For sure. Yeah, this is our hope from these activities that uh, we are also shaping the field and providing our input to the whole pharmaceutical industry. This is obviously an important opportunity basically to work on the scientific part of it and to make sure that this is published and available to the scientific community so they can build on and try further experiments that eventually gets picked up into a regulatory guidance. Uh, but I think and I see another opportunity for, for when we also do this research is to really collaborate. And this is, I think this, these collaborations also in, in research environments obviously also provide a lot of opportunity to interact, to even hear the questions that may come from an actual medical perspective and then be able to drive experimental data for that and to be able to supply mm -hmm. that information and back to the field. So I do think that, that this whole element obviously can advance science, can advance regulations. Uh, has the opportunity to collaborate and I think also has the opportunity to really help educating the field. Wonderful. Thank you both for your time and for illustrating the importance of ensuring the safety of administration devices. Join us next time when we will bring you the latest advances in gene editing and how it is being used to create cell therapies for treating cancer.